Hello, and welcome to the Clinics Review Articles podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Lauren Boyle, the Managing Editor for Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Clinics here at Elsevier. The series is a quarterly publication consisting of review articles centered on a key topic of interest for practicing psychiatrists. In this podcast, we will be discussing our January 2017 volume of the series on health information technology for child and adolescent psychiatry. Joining me for the talk today are the issue's guest editors, Drs. Barry Sarvet and John Toros. Dr. Sarvet is with Bay State Health and the University of Massachusetts Medical School, Bay State in Massachusetts. Dr. Toros is with Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School, also in Massachusetts. Welcome and thanks so much to the both of you for joining me today. In your preface to the issue, you joke that child and adolescent psychiatry has finally caught up to the rest of medicine as far as beginning to integrate technology into patient care and practice. Can you talk a little bit about why it took this field longer to get there, as well as some of the overarching challenges of using technology in treating child and adolescent patient populations? I'm the child psychiatrist um, of the two of us that... um that John is a, 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 a general psychiatrist uh, with a special interest in informatics. And we, we both obviously have an inf- uh, interest in informatics, but, but I brought the, the sort of child psychiatry sort of uh, specific uh, content expertise to this uh, project. And, um, and it really is true. I think it's, it's the same is true of, of, of adult psychiatry, um, uh, that um, psychiatry is a fairly traditional field. But I think we embrace um, kind of traditional uh, elements of practice, and and traditions really kind of take a long time to change. And 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 so, so so unlike other fields where there are you know new medications coming out every uh, year, and and where there are new you know procedures and technologies and inventions, um, psychiatry is a is a slower to evolve field, at least in, from my perspective. You know, having been you know a psychiatrist for now about. Uh, 27 years or so and so 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 I think that's part of it um, and, and, I, and I also think that there's a general uh, discomfort with um, having you know machines and, and tools you know mediate the the or, or interfere with the the doctor patient relationship and the development of rapport and, and and sort of more organic kinds of communication so there's a fear that that machines and and computers will kind of dehumanize uh, the field. So so psychiatry has a very long tradition of of really humanism, um, and and I think that that's one of the, the the concerns. But but I'm speculating. I don't think that that um, you know we have good data to explain you know why we've been resistant. Um, but um, you know I think the psychiatrists you know need to trust. You know these tools, and 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 the field has been changing so rapidly. I, I think there's a, a fear of of change, and a, and a fear that 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 technology will degrade, you know, the richness of the um, doctor-patient uh, interaction. I would echo what Barry said. Is a lot of this technology until recent years, patients, including child and adolescent patients, people didn't have access to the type of smartphones, they didn't have the internet connectivity, the things that we could do with technology in the recent past really didn't present novel reasons to kind of change clinical practice, to really delve into this research, to learn what are the potential, because not that many people had, I mean, the smartphone is only a decade old, so it's only been around for 10 years, and it's really become more powerful and more prevalent, a number of sensors. In this issue, we go over a lot of different things these phones can record and what it means. So it's really only in the last few years that we've reached a point where increasingly people have these devices, and these devices are at a potential where they can really perhaps give us important clinical information. And I think so we're realizing that the potential is now real. This is the time to begin to look at it, and we it may not be... Certainly just because we can do it, because we can record it, doesn't mean we should. Because we can collect data doesn't mean that it's valuable. But it certainly means that we should begin to look into it, to evaluate it, which is kind of what the special edition does. It says these things are here. It's important that we as a field have a role in shaping them. And let's look at what they're actually doing. I think psychiatrists historically have had a, a pretty significant um, 
need and and concern about uh, you know the the need to protect uh, confidentiality, and I think that's one of the things that I hear a lot of psychiatrists um, have discomfort with when they put uh, clinical information into an electronic medical record. Uh, that, that psychiatrists uh, have always been very protective of, of the information, you know, for good reason, because, you know, psychiatric illnesses are so, uh, and, and patients are stigmatized, and, and, and so we're trying to protect, you know, the, the, the safety and, and, and the privacy of, of the treatment, and, and so I think that's been a major barrier in terms of adoption, at least uh, for electronic medical record technology, if not you know, other kinds of technology that involve, you know, sharing uh, information. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about Dr. Emily Wu and colleagues' article on confidentiality and privacy for smartphone applications in child and adolescent psychiatry. The article covers unmet needs and practical solutions. So what are some of the key issues to consider when addressing issues of confidentiality and consent for mobile tools used in child and adolescent psychiatric care? How do you view the risks versus the benefits? I'll jump in because I was a co-author actually on this article and I think the takeaway message actually is we know surprisingly little about confidentiality and consent on using mobile apps and especially using these smartphone tools and partially I said we go into the article we explore how the laws around consent for child and adolescent psychiatry can vary from state to state and when people can consent when they can access information what they can do and that certainly is a confusing, as a non-child absence psychiatrist, it certainly appears confusing on the surface. And we add on new technology that can operate across state lines. It becomes very blurry and murky on what may be legal, what may not be legal, who can access information, how you cannot access information. So we explore how certainly some apps and some programs actually may have different policies by state by state and depending on where you're accessing it from. We also explore how the FDA hasn't really directly tackled this issue. As I said, it's an evolving issue of what these apps can do, what they can collect, who can consent to be in them. So we record some of the things that have been done to date, but we actually conclude that it's an issue that really needs a lot of leadership from the psychiatric community to step up and say, We have a new way that people are going to be accessing care. We need to think about what are the new ways that we do consent for this and that we help people access it and we make sure people who shouldn't access it don't access it. So I I guess I would add that um, the field of clinical applications is, um, you know, an emerging field and it has the feeling of of like the Wild West, you know, so to speak. And and so it's it's lawless. And uh, there's no sheriff, you know, who's controlling it, and and so along the lines of of, of our our need and responsibility to to help patients to protect their privacy in the context of doing this work, um, it's just an area that that people really have to pay attention to and be cautious about. Um, and and you know there are certain applications that. Um, uh, are clearly have thought through this um, and certain companies that are developing applications uh, um, and then there are some that 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 seem to be oblivious to it and um, and so so it is difficult I think for practitioners to navigate this and to know you know what to recommend uh, to patients uh, based on this um, so so it's a challenging area I think that um, it's hard for us to know uh, with with confidence um, you know, how to proceed in some cases. What do do you think, John? I mean, I think it's going to be the case where we're going to have to build new standards, and we're going to have to build those new standards by really getting all the different stakeholders in a room together. Because you can imagine this involves parents, this involves child and adolescents as patients, this involves psychiatrists, this involves technology makers, this involves businesses, this involves the federal government. So there's a lot of different stakeholders that haven't yet come together to kind of say, this is the issue, here's what we need to work on it. So I think until we see new standards emerge for how we manage confidential and privacy, it's going to be, as Barry said, the Wild West. And I think one thing certainly that's important for any practicing psychiatrist is at least privacy policies can be frightening to look at, they can be long, but at least if you're recommending one of these apps or technologies, 
for use by a patient, you should check and see where does that data go to? Who owns that data? So if you have a patient and they're entering all their medicines, if the app is collecting sensor data like GPS, is that data being kept secure and private? Who is it going to? Can the patient delete it? These are questions that's probably worth taking a look at at this point to make sure that you and your patient really both know where your data is going. Because in the age where there's no clear standards and these things can live outside of federal privacy laws like HIPAA, you really do have to double check in this kind of Wild West period, as Barry said, what's happening. I want to discuss the article by Adam Powell and colleagues on the economic benefits of mobile apps for mental health and telepsychiatry services when used by adolescents. What are some of the direct and indirect benefits of mobile apps for mental health and telepsychiatry as they relate to ROI? Powell and colleagues do a very good job of pointing out that telepsychiatry, mobile apps for mental health, I said these are relatively new things. And I said we're learning what certainly to implement them to make them successful. They have to have business models that make sense. And what they go over in this article is they kind of explain what are some of the direct cost savings that you can realize if you're using telepsychiatry or mobile apps. And I said it's kind of the direct costs can be certainly what you would kind of see up front, like savings from, I said, people not having to come to the clinic, increased volume that you could see perhaps managing a larger panel of patients. These are things that are more easy to quantify and measure. And what's interesting that Powell et, et al. explores, they kind of say, what are the indirect costs? If we can now reach more people with mobile apps and telepsychiatry, if we can help people, our colleagues in primary care manage more people, if we can begin to work on helping people stay in school, there may actually be indirect costs that really are tremendous in terms of saving, in terms of benefit to society, and we haven't done as good a job at quantifying what those savings will be. So if we were to start a telepsychiatry program that offers people more access to care from remote areas, I said there's certainly some direct costs that we'll see. I said there's less travel time, but what are the long-term savings that we'll see from this? And part of what Powell does a really good job of saying, you know, we haven't had a great way to begin to measure and quantify this so far. And we think there's the indirect benefits of these mobile apps for mental health will really be tremendous, but I said we haven't really jumped into quantifying. They kind of propose that the next frontier is really beginning to look at the long-term picture. It's one thing to help people kind of use an app or telepsychiatry to get the right medicine now, but what does it mean if we kind of get them on the right track for a longer duration? And I guess I could also add, I said certainly they raise some interesting questions that I think are useful for people to ask sometimes when you're trying to evaluate, is this going to be a useful thing to bring into my practice? Should I be using this app? Is it going to make economic sense? They raise a series of questions in box one that certainly can help guide thinking about this and kind of helping you make a more informed decision, thinking about what return on investment would mean Again, for a technology that we really don't know very much about and that we have evidence that's young but continuing to evolve. I also wanted to ask you a couple of questions about the article done by Dr. Christopher Arcangeli and his team about mobile health interventions for psychiatric conditions in children, which is a scoping review. Tell us about some of the key findings this author team uncovers in their literature study to provide support for the use of mobile health interventions in the practice of child and adolescent psychiatry. I think this is a really interesting paper because, as I said, one of the few, if not only, scoping reviews of smartphone apps for use in child and adolescent psychiatry conditions. And what's almost shocking is the authors did a very thorough and exhaustive search, but they actually only found eight papers that were published in the academic literature that kind of were that were included in the review. I said they're actually, despite the number of apps that you could find if you go to the iTunes or Android store and type in depression, child, or adolescent psychiatry, there only were eight papers when they did their search that really provided evidence. And of those eight papers, only two of them really looked at effectiveness using randomized controlled trials. So really two of them had what we consider the best practice for learning about do these tools really work. And in these two studies that they point out were the highest quality, they actually found out that these apps weren't impacting clinical outcomes. There's no difference in the control group. And what, so it kind of goes to the point that Barry was saying earlier is we have a lot of potential, we have a lot of excitement, we have a lot of new technology, but 
we still don't know a lot about it. We don't know a lot about how it works. And I said, certainly this paper stone, we sit back, go to the library, read all the papers, see what our colleagues from around the world have done, and realize there's only eight studies that we can look at, and of those eight studies, two of them are of the highest quality, and those two actually show that there's no significant result. That does make us pause and say, hey, we probably need to be doing a lot more research. We need to be studying this before we're saying this is the way for the future. We need to roll this out into clinical care. We need to be using it. We really need to be gathering more high-quality data. And I said, certainly, I said, there's new research coming out Constantly, I said, even since this review was done, and I said this issue of clinical reviews was published, I said there have been more studies, but there still aren't a tremendous amount of studies, which means that the evidence is really limited. So I think it certainly does give reason for pause. We have to step back and say, what do we hope this technology will do? What do we aspire for it to be? And what is the actual clinical reality? Where do we live right now? And this article is a very good job of saying, we're still excited, we think there's potential, but really we don't know very much right now. I just want to take a quick pause here to let our listeners know they can receive an exclusive discount on the issue we are discussing today by visiting the website us.elsevierhealth.com slash expert. In the article written by Dr. Stephen Schuler and his colleagues, the team discusses online treatment and virtual therapists in child and adolescent psychiatry. What are some of the benefits of a virtual therapy session as opposed to an in-person session with child and adolescent patients? What are some of the challenges? The promise, you know, and the, and the hope, you know, of, of uh, a lot of this technology is really to reduce barriers um, to access because you know, child psychiatry and children's mental health services and psychiatry in general faces enormous access barriers, uh, issues of transportation, uh, economic costs of uh, having to, parents having to take off time from work uh, to bring their kids to an appointment, uh, the workforce shortage. Um, so I think that's a, a major driver of some of the online and mobile applications. And, and then there's just the whole issue of engagement. You know, I think that, um, that, that we're always trying to find ways of delivering mental health treatment that um, patients are engaged with and excited about and, and motivated to, to use. And, and, and some forms of therapy um, are better or worse that you know at engaging children and 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 one size doesn't fit all and 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 so so th- treatment needs to become very personalized and and technology uh, could be an avenue for uh, delivering uh, treatments that uh, you know could be very appealing um, to some people and not not to everyone and 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 it's also very customizable so so there are all kinds of advantages to using technology to innovate uh, in terms of clinical treatment. And, and, and I guess I, I wanted to move into talking a little bit about one of the concepts um, uh, that uh, Dr. Schuler and his team uh, highlighted in the article. One of the, one of the concepts he describes is um, this concept called skeuomorphism. That's a, a word that's not familiar to everyone, um, but it really, it, it's a term that, that, that it, it's, a, it's really an issue about design. So how, how do you design a uh, treatment or, or a, a form of, um, of clinical practice um, that uh, is in the virtual world or in the, in the technology space? Um, and, and, and the notion of skeuomorphism is, is, is it's, it's kind of a, a somewhat of an old-fashioned uh, notion that uh, if you move a treatment from uh, sort of a traditional format into a, a computer format, uh, you're going to try to reproduce um, kind of the treatment in online form. So an example of skeuomorphism is if you have a, uh, a note-taking application, for example, on a computer or a smartphone, a skeuomorphic uh, uh, example of that is is where where the user interface looks like a notepad. You know, it has spiral rings, you know, on the on the side or on top, and it has the same color as a notepad, and 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 you're kind of typing into it or interacting with it the same way that you would a real note notepad. And I guess the one of the points that the the key points of the article is that 
that in order to to really achieve you know some some of the you know potential of of uh, using computers and treatment is that that we need to kind of jump away from this need to simply reproduce uh, treatments in online form, but but we can leverage some of the advantages of technology and create brand new you know, ways of delivering treatment that, that, that may look very different from traditional treatment. So it's not like just a matter of um, kind of reproducing a psychotherapy session on a computer. Uh, and and so, so the article really does um, outline concepts of how technology could be used and, and has been used uh, to really innovate in a way that, that leverages um, what we've learned about uh, how children um, interact with computers and, and, and to leverage some of the um, advantages of, of some of those um, uh, concepts. And, and so, so, the, so the article discusses a, a, n- a number of different ways that, that online and virtual treatments have been designed to, to really move away from just trying to reproduce uh, traditional practice and, and to, to begin to innovate using concept of, uh, concepts of, of, of computer child interactions that, that have been disco- discovered in, in other fields. One of the nice things about this article is that um, <clears throat> it, it really kind of in, it incorporates um, some lines of, of evidence and, and science that, that psychiatrists would never ordinarily encounter in their own kind of scientific and clinical literature because because the, the 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 engineering sort of um, uh, knowledge of child computer interaction is something that uh, most of us don't uh, encounter in our training I would agree and I think it certainly raises a challenge for psychiatry as a field to think there's been an initial wave, I said, to kind of take a lot of things that work well face-to-face, say, or like CBT therapies, and put them in a digital app form. But sometimes that can just be moving content directly onto a phone. So what are new ways that we can use technology that we don't currently? And one example may be perhaps if we're trying to help people with sleep hygiene, it's possible increasingly that the phone may be connected to smart sensors in a home and that those smart sensors may know to dim the lights we want to encourage someone to go to bed. And so we can we kind of use these phones as a proxy to soon kind of encourage healthy habits by environmental cues. So kind of thinking things that we can't currently do or it's more difficult to do, maybe that will be the true future of this technology and how we're using it. So I think it's certainly expanding thinking about what different futures could look like and saying it may not have to be limited to what we're doing now. And of course, anything like that would certainly be very new. It would potentially have to, we'd have to understand, does it work? What is the research behind it? What are the ethical concerns? What are the safety concerns? But I think this article really does say that we have the opportunity now to even go beyond what we're currently doing and imagine things that may have been almost impractical now, but may be more practical and that's certainly an opportunity for innovation in psychiatry. It's certainly like making anything that's brand new. It's a challenge as well. One of the examples of um, you know, trying to develop uh, tools uh, for treatment that uh, really are not analogous to what happens in an office um, is this notion of... Um, of really this the, the term gamification um, I don't know if people have uh, commonly encountered that word but but it's this way of, of, of trying to provide an experience um, with a, a technological tool or an app uh, that um, you know really engages a child and helps them to experience you know a kind of engagement that parents are often, really frustrated about when they see their kids playing video games you know that that if you if you see a kid playing video games they're completely immersed oftentimes in the game it's hard to get them to stop playing they're extremely motivated to kind of take on challenges within the game Uh, the game is giving them all kinds of reinforcement and feedback and parents have a hard it's so powerful that parents often get frustrated because they have a hard time competing with the game to get their kids' attention, and 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 obviously it's not good, you know. Be, oftentimes, because the game 
you know, could be taking up uh, more time than it should, you know, in a child's life and, and, and eclipsing other activities. But what, if the game is therapeutic and if the game is designed to, to help a child to develop coping skills or to develop certain kinds of um, patterns of uh, thinking and behavior that could help them overcome a mental illness, then of course we would think that that would be a good thing, at least, you know, in, you know, in limited form. In their article, Dr. Sarah Coffey and her team discuss the use of health information technology within collaborative and integrated care models of child and adolescent psychiatric practice. Can you tell us a little bit about the different types of integrated care models within child and adolescent care? Who are the typical stakeholders and how do they work together? So the three models of integrated care that are, are described in this paper, um, aside from you know issues of technology, but really is is the, the backdrop for this paper is is um, includes the behavioral health clinician model, the child psychiatry access program model, and and the collaborative care model. The behavioral health clinician model is is the model where you have an embedded therapist, usually a, a social worker or a psychologist, um, who works in a primary care practice and tries to be available to uh, help the primary care providers and the team to screen uh, patients for mental illness and to uh, begin to address, to, to evaluate and, 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 and make plans to treat uh, patients, oftentimes make referrals, uh, do warm handoffs, you know, which involve um, introducing patients to clinicians that would treat them and, and help facilitate access. The other model, uh, um, the next model is the CPAP model, or the, it stands for Child Psychiatry Access Program model, which is a, a geographic um, model where you would have a team of mental health professionals who are making themselves available to Consult with pediatricians and other primary care providers, and um, and 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 help them to uh, care for those patients, and and provide face-to-face uh, -face consults, and and do uh, care planning uh, for them. Uh, but it's really a remote sort of model because the, the the clinicians are not embedded in the practice. And then the third model is the uh, collaborative care model, which is also an embedded uh, clinician model and involves. Um, the use of uh, registries to uh, assist in, in providing measurement-based care uh, to patients with specific clinical syndromes and, and tracking the progress of those patients and, and providing consultation and office-based uh, treatment and care management to those patients to try to help treat their conditions to a, a target of, of remission. So those three models uh, are, are, are the background of this, and, and, and the article really uh, tried to cover and, and discuss uh, some of the technology that's really needed in order to um, effectively support uh, this whole enterprise of trying to, to enhance uh, the ability of primary care teams to deliver mental health treatment and to to support collaboration and coordination of treatment uh, across uh, different kinds of barriers, such as the barriers between primary care providers and mental health systems, and barriers between therapists and people who are prescribing medications and, and things like that. So those are the collaborative care models that were, were discussed in, the, in this paper. The meat of the paper really talks, it includes um, a discussion of, of, of some of the, the technological uh, solutions that are, are really necessary to support um, all three of these collaborative models. And, and, and so each model is a little bit different in terms of the emphasis. You know, some of the key uh, technological solutions um, that are needed for any of these models include uh, tools that would help address um, population health and, and and the tools that 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 we speak about most in, in that context are, are registries and and so in the CPAP model and and the collaborative care model uh, really um, warrant um, the the use of, of tools that help practices to be able to keep track of, of their panel of patients as a group and to be able to 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 monitor uh, how they're doing uh, as a group as opposed to just trusting that uh, when a person has been given a referral, for example, that 
that, that things will just unfold and the patient will be treated and everything will go well. Uh, we all know that um, treatment, uh, effective treatment requires lots of troubleshooting. Patients don't always get what they need. Uh, they drop out of treatment. Uh, you might do screens and then find out that um, no one made a referral or you might make a referral and find out that it um, didn't work out. And so, so, so mechanisms um, to uh, ensure that patients are, are progressing through treatment uh, as a group um, where you're having to track large numbers of, of, of patients require uh, information technology systems that really support that and, and, and really that's all about registries and, and so, so we talked about how tools can be developed to support um, population-based you know health in that context. The other thing has to do with um, communication tools um, because all collaboration requires the exchange of information and so so we discussed um, different types of uh, ways to transfer information to support collaboration practices involving secure messaging, shared electronic medical records, um, different forms of synchronous and asynchronous communication that computers can help to facilitate. And then finally, um, another piece of the puzzle with most collaborative care systems, including all three models that, I, that, that, that we, we outlined, involve the use of measurement-based care. And so, so measurement-based care, as, as John actually alluded to when we were talking about um, some of the online and virtual treatments involve um, uh, technology to support patients' self-rating, how they're doing in terms of their conditions. And so this might involve technology that would track uh, symptom severity for whatever you're treating. Um, and when we, we begin to talk about self-monitoring and self-rating and self-tracking, then we get into portal technology where, where there has to be some um, mechanism for the patients to be able to communicate with their providers and, with, and, and to be able to, to get their own information into medical records in a usable format that would allow providers and patients to be able to track their progress. Um, that's, a, that's a key element uh, for measurement-based care. And so, so there's a discussion of the use of patient portals and the use of, of self-monitoring and self-tracking applications to support uh, measurement-based care. So that's the content that was covered in that article, um, and, and it was a broad overview of the, the different technologies that, 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 that will be needed to support these models of practice. To close out our discussion, would either of you like to share a final thought or key takeaway for a clinician who might be looking to incorporate some of these technologies into their practice? I think my key takeaway would be we're certainly in the early stages of using these new mobile and connected and digital technologies for care, but we're learning a lot very rapidly. And I think what's nice about this special edition is I said you can dive in and pick the topic that you're most interested in. But as we've kind of explained, a lot of these topics are interconnected. Business models matter with security. Security matters with efficacy. Efficacy matters with the different models of care we can have. So I think when you kind of go through all the different articles in addition, I think you kind of see an evolving ecosystem where no one part is separated. Each of these papers is connected in different ways to each other. And I said certainly you can learn about by looking at these different papers alone, certain focus areas, but I think the real value is when you kind of put the big picture together, you can begin to see this evolving ecosystem and get clues to where it's moving next. I agree, John, and I also feel like, um, you know, we started off this conversation talking about the resistance of uh, psychiatrists and child psychiatrists to adopt uh, some of the new technology. And, and I guess, you know, one of the takeaways that I come to in thinking about this is that there's a reason for caution. You know, that, that, that there's, there are questions about efficacy that are still outstanding. Uh, and I think there will be for a long time. There's a lot of development that needs to be take, needs to take place, um, you know, that w which you emphasized um, in your remarks just now. And so I have mixed feelings that I would certainly encourage my colleagues to really embrace and to have an open mind and to be curious and to, to learn about the technology. Um, but I actually feel like it's appropriate for, for psychiatrists to be cautious, you know, not, not cautious to the point of um, 
burying your head in the sand, but but cautious in terms of not uh, being sort of overly exuberant or impulsive around you know adopting technology because there's still a lot of question as far as um, you know safety, effectiveness, uh, return on investment, and privacy and confidentiality, and and so I think that there's a lot of enormous opportunity, and and I think there are things that we can adopt now. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm sort of in support of people being cautious and, and, and not, you know, sort of jumping in uh, without uh, a lot of care and, and consideration. I would agree. I think we have to, as a field, it's evolving. It's important that we stay on top of it, even if we're not using these technologies today, that we make sure as a field that psychiatry is engaged in how these are developed, how the evidence is created, so we can shape it, so we can shape these to work in a way that we hope in the future. I think, as said, so as, as Barry said, we can't ignore this because then who knows what's going to be created and that we may end up having to use that we don't want. It's important that we're involved in the development. Just because we're involved in the development doesn't mean it's the final product. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Clinics Review Articles podcast. For an exclusive discount on the issue we discussed today, focusing on health information technology for child and adolescent psychiatry, visit the website us.elsevierhealth.com slash expert. Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Clinics is available for print subscription with accompanying online access, individual online only access, and on Elsevier's electronic platforms, Clinical Key and Science Direct. For more information on this series and our nearly 60 titles spanning all medical disciplines, visit the website info.theclinics.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at the handle at Clinics Reviews and subscribe to the Clinics Review Articles podcast on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.